Okay, we're on to chapter six, game theory, and this is partially AS, the last exercise, and one of the middle exercises being A2 here. Now, this is a huge area of mathematics, and it's actually just very briefly touched on in D2, and I really want to encourage you to watch this video down here to see how exciting and varied this field of maths is. It really is an excellent video. It's by a really, really good YouTube channel, and it will set what we're learning about in context far more than I can just offer in a little short video at the beginning of a playlist. So do watch this, you know, maybe it's quite enjoyable. It doesn't feel very heavy, so it doesn't need to be something that is done as part of work. You could do it as something that you might enjoy. Now, essentially, game theory is the math is the mathematics of games. And actually, sometimes people will use game theory for even like crazy things like war about like what decisions countries might be making in whether to, you know, what things to do in their sort of geopolitics. And it basically just says like how these games should be played or how war should be played and what strategies that we should employ to try and get the best particular outcomes. So I would definitely go and have a look at this thing because it's a really cool video. Um, and even if you don't watch the whole thing, you'll get a good flavor of why game theory is such an interesting and exciting area of maths. And we'll start off for exercise A, looking at play safe strategies and stable solutions. 6B is only for A2, it's about reducing a payoff matrix. 6C goes back to AS and still has little bits of A2. Um, optimal strategies for unstable games. I'll, see what, I'll tell you what I mean by there being some bits of A2 in there, because you'll see in the exercise some things will be uh, related to 6B. And then last of all, A2 only is linear programming. And as usual, I'll finish off with some exam questions as well. So to begin with, we're going to think about a very famous example that, again, if you're interested in this, um, you can go and look at some videos on YouTube about this that will do far more better explanations than I could do of this. But this is kind of like the original, most famous problem in game theory that we have, and it is called the prisoner's dilemma. So here is the dilemma. Two people are arrested for a suspected crime, and the following is offered to them separately, so they cannot communicate with each other. They get told that if neither of you confess, you will both be sent to prison for one year. So uh, this bit is the bit down here. If A does not confess and B does not confess, this number is referring to A, this number refers to B, obviously in the order of the alphabet. So A would go to prison for a year, B would go to a prison for a year. That's why we put them as negatives, because that's a bad thing. Nobody's wanting to go to prison. If you both confess, you will each be sent to prison for four years, which is this outcome. Now, the third um, sort of outcome, which is referring to these ones, is if you confess and testify against the other, you will be set free and the other will be sent to prison for 10 years. So if A confesses, they don't go to prison. But if B doesn't confess and says that B was the one that did it, then they will go to prison for 10 years. So that's not very good for B. And vice versa. If A doesn't confess, but B does, A will go to prison for 10 years and B will get away completely free here. Now, it should be really like, what should they do? And, you know, how should they play this particular game? And there's loads of different variations on this game. So you'll probably see quite a lot of different um, versions if you do go and look into anything to do with game theory. Now, let's think about what they might do when they're choosing. Um, so when choosing what to think or what to do, sorry, A might think, OK, well, if I confess... I'll either go to prison for four years or not at all. Those are the two possible things that can happen if A confesses. And that's really the only thing that A can control, what they actually decide to do. And if they don't confess, then there's a chance they'll either go to prison for 10 years or one year. Now, both of these outcomes here sound worse because even if that B is going to confess, well, they'd be going to prison for 10 years here or four, so that seems better. And if B doesn't confess, they'd either be going to prison for one year or not at all. So actually there's no incentive here for A not to confess. It feels like both of these are better. So both of these outcomes sound worse, so I'm gonna confess. Now, B thinks the exact same thing. So they both confess, and then they end up going to prison for four years, when they could have just cooperated and not confessed, only going to prison for a year instead. So both of this logic that we've described in this first part thinks, OK, well, for for me, for A, this is definitely better in both scenarios. So I'm going to confess. B confesses. They've both ended up going to prison for four years. But clearly there was a better outcome for both of them where they both could have not confessed and they would have not gone to prison for four years each, just one year. But people don't always think in this way either. Perhaps B knows that A is going to do this, and so... So maybe B thinks, OK, I know that A is going to confess because minus 4 is better than minus 10 and 0 is better than minus 1. So B is now pretty sure that A is going to confess and so kind of forces it into that option. 
but it could also be you might predict that the other person is not going to confess. Um, sorry, yes, if they're not going to confess, so B could confess and sort of force them to go to prison. So the strategies aren't always as straightforward as they might kind of seem here. So you need to try and think like, what might the other person be doing instead? But we start off with quite a simple kind of strategy here, which has got echoes of this game that we have. Oh, it's not really a game, is it, going to prison? Um, but we're going to talk about this strategy, which is called the play safe strategy that we've got here. Now, this one kind of does exactly what it sounds like. You're going to play the game safely. You're not going to take risks. You're always going to think what's the worst that could happen and then try and make that outcome as good as possible. So we're going to determine the play safe strategy for each player for the below payoff matrix. Now, each number is referring to A for the first part and B for the second part. It always does this part followed by the column headings that we've got. So what we're going to do is we're going to look across each row for A and find the minimum. That's like the worst thing that could happen in each part for A. So the minimum that could happen for A out of these, we have an 8, a 0 and a 7. So the minimum is a 0. The minimum in the next part, we have a 3, a 9 and a 2, a 1, a 6 and an 8, a 4, a 4 and a 5 that we've got here. So this is the worst that could happen to A in all of the different choices they've got to play between 1, 2, 3 and 4. And we want to go to the place where the maximum is going to be found. Because if A is going to play it safe, in this one down here, they could either get 4, 4 or 5. And so you know what? This is a pretty safe place to go because the minimum outcome that they could get is a 4 that we've got here. So A's play safe strategy is going to be to play 4. So A's play safe A's play safe strategy is to play four. This guarantees a minimum win of four. This guarantees a minimum win of four. And that could be four pounds, it could be four anything, but we want whatever it is that is in the game there. So that's A's play safe strategy that we've got. Now for B's play safe strategy, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to be finding the minimum of these columns because this is what happens if B plays one. So if B was going to play one, well, they could either get two, six, seven, or two. So they'd get at least two. If B plays two, they could get nine, zero, four, or six. So they might end up with nothing there. And if B plays three, they could get three, seven, one, or one that we have. So it looks like the minimum that B could get there is one. So it looks like the strategy that B is going to play is going to be this. So I'm going to say B's, let's do this in purple. Beads is to play one. This guarantees a minimum winning or a minimum payoff. I might use payoff as a different language here of two. So it looks like if they were both playing safe, this is the one that would end up. A would win four and B would win two. Would win two. And these things that we've just calculated, these are called maxi mins because they were the minimums and we've picked the maximums of the minimums, the maxi mins. We were wanting to maximize the minimum payout that you could get here. OK, now, obviously, this isn't what would necessarily happen because you might get other layers of strategy where A is like, OK, well, I think B is going to play one because he likes to play safe. So because B is going to play one. I actually think I might play one as well because then I would get eight. But then B might think, OK, well, I think that A is going to think this and A is going to play one. So if A is going to play one, I might end up playing a different game, playing two because that's where B would win nine instead of two. So game theory is quite complex because it depends on what the other strategy is that people might use. But for now, when we took a play safe strategy, this is a particular version of it where people are going to play safe. And this doesn't seem like a stable game because like I've just said here, if A decided to mix up the strategy and play one to try and get more, well, then B might mix up their strategy and play two to get even more. And that could keep going and going and going. So that's what we would call an unstable kind of game. We want to see to begin with what kind of stable ones that we might find. OK, in the next video, I'm going to be talking to you about zero sum games and actually a bit more of a solid approach about how we might do some of these questions in game theory. So I will see you in the next video.